Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another uh, VITA Learning Webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And we've got uh, Mr. Mark Wagonseal going over the dentures, uh, title of Principles of Denture Fabrication and Freedom of Movement Architecture. Uh, very hot topic today as far as getting interested in dentures. Those of you who have uh, learned that maybe you need to expand into dentures, uh, learn uh, more principles when it, when it comes to treatment planning and development of uh, dentures, uh, how to work with uh, your dentist or work with your patient if you're a denturist. Um, Mark uh, Wagnerseal is a denturist up in Canada. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Super duper. Good morning. All right. Excellent. Thanks for uh, joining us today, Mark. Thank you for the kind invitation. Yeah. So uh, before we get going today, I just want to cover a few uh, items, a uh, few of the uh, um, in-house items here. So the, everyone that's on the webinar right now, your phone is on mute. However, if you uh, have uh, your setup on the upper right-hand corner, usually on your desktop, you will find the GoToWebinar panel. And within that panel, there is a question box that you want to open up. And if you have any questions during the program, go ahead and type them in, send them to us uh, so that we can review them. And at the end of the program, we're going to have a, a question and answer session with Mark. So please use that question box, and then we will get those questions answered at the end. This webinar, like always, will be recorded so that you can review it later. Give us a couple of days, but it will be posted on our Vita YouTube channel. Uh, we will also have links to uh, LinkedIn and also Instagram as well as Facebook on this video recording. So please visit us. We have a tremendous number of webinars that have been recorded uh, this past year uh, with Mark and others. Uh, Mark has done a great job. We've, we've gone over class one, class two, class three, combination syndromes, uh, basic uh, denture setups. So pretty much anything that you want, uh, you have a question about, you can either revisit our uh, webinar on our website on Vita North America YouTube channel. If you have any questions, you can certainly get a hold of us here at the uh, Avita North America, or even Mark himself. Uh, so today, Mark Wagonseal is a denturist. Uh, so again, he's going over principles of denture fabrication. Uh, Mark is a Vita Global Certified Trainer and Management Consultant. He's a licensed denturist and has been for over the past 30 years. Uh, like all of us, he grows every day. Uh, learn something from all of us. Mark loves to um, communicate with you and, and train and educate all technicians and denturists as well as dentists. Uh, so Mark is as a denturist. He gives us a certain perspective from being able to work with a patient directly. However, he's able to simplify this for the rest of us that are non-denturists, non-dentists, so that we can understand what is needed from the dental practice to make a perfect denture, to treatment plan and analyze a denture accordingly. Uh, he, Mark owns and operates his own lab. It's called Heritage Denture Center in Edmonton, Canada. Uh, Mark has spent his career focusing on how dentures integrate in the mouth and body, so he, he knows a little bit more uh, in depth about the science, right? He, he knows the clinical aspects, what's really needed to diagnose the proper classification of a denture, you know, how is it to set up according to the patient's needs, not just a cookie-cutter denture. Uh, he also inspires a unique awareness of occlusion and professional growth. He loves to educate, loves to train uh, of technicians, dentists, and other denturists. So, Mark, 
uh, I will let you become the uh, presenter now. Uh, thank you again for for uh, doing this webinar and sharing with you with the rest of us uh, your knowledge. And I will now let you take it over. So welcome again, Mark. Appreciate it. All right. We're good. You we are so good. Yeah. All right then. All right. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Whoop, whoop. We do not slap teeth together. None of us. We don't slap them together. Good morning. Thanks for investing in yourself. Thanks for taking time to share with me. Thank you for trying to better our professions as dentures and dental technicians and as doctors as we move forward every day to be a superhero for a patient. They trust us, whether they see us directly or not. They put faith in the team to deliver and become their superhero to help them eat, live, function. It's a great responsibility from us. We love what we do. And, and I always like to ask, what, what drawed you or what drew you into becoming a dental technician or the love of dentures or a denturist or a doctor? Why'd you do it? Why'd you do it? Well, we love to serve, we love to help people, we like the dentistry, we, we like that working to find detail, we like those things, and that's important. You have to love what you do. It's eight to 10 hours a day of our time, and especially when we deal with patients, it can be very uh, challenging at moments because, again, we're dealing with a person and, and their feelings and expectations placed on us, and our goal always is to become their superhero and to help them. So thank you. My goal is to share with you my journey. I'm 51. Started caring for patients when I was 17. It's been 34 years of my life building dentures. And, and I have to tell you, I love what I do. It's the right career path for me. It's the right job for me. And I love it. And I want to share with you my journey uh, for building teeth after all these years. So thanks very much. I want to now jump screens and uh, take you into a quick little PowerPoint. Jim, is this popping up? Yes, right. your PowerPoint is up. Okay. Good. Just and I see your sure. cursor. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. A couple of things I want to go through, everyone, just to lay the foundation before we get into setting up the teeth. So thank you. It's going to be a review for some, and for others, it's going to be your first uh, journey into this. So th thank you uh, for your perspectives. What are our common denture issues that we deal with directly when we deal with patients? Uh, and, and from a laboratory perspective, denture teeth a chip, break, and pop off. I was really good at the beginning part of my career. Patients can't chew well with a new denture, and they're complaining. New dentures are loose, more loose than the old set. Multiple relines with no success. Of course, breakage. Food collects under the denture, but we don't need to reline it. New denture feels too big. Soreness. I love this. My old dentures fit better than my new ones. Mm -hmm. And the temporary implant denture is preferred over the permanent one we make them. That's frustrating as well. So all of these issues cause us stress. They're stressful for us because we have to deal with the issue and it can become frustrating what is our 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 commonality is we work to detail we work to a standard and then we expect that patient to fall into that standard and what i've humbly learned in my journey is now i've never met a standard patient they are what they are they're unique and individual and it is my goal to mold myself and my technique and my experience to them and sometimes i have to swim that navigation or swim the waters of gray area to to move things and bend the rules to make it work for them and on other occasions i have to be firm to say no we're doing it my way this is how we're going to approach the case remember they trust you they place their trust in you but with that said 
you sometimes also have to maintain firm with your journey and your experiences of what you believe you can and cannot do for that person. I've challenged myself, and there's some things that I'll show you in a moment with some pictures that, that again, I would have never have believed 30 years ago when I was in school that I can now do now. I want to talk quickly about the teeth and, and the importance of the material. It's a microfilled MRP, microfilled reinforced polyacrylic. It is 85% polymethyl methacrylate, 14% inorganic filler, and 1% shade. I want to zone in on the inorganic filler. That 14% is silica. Silica, by definition, is quartz. Quartz, by definition, is glass. This is an acrylic glass tooth. Why do I like acrylic glass? And why do I like the product? Number one, it's hard. Number two, it has characteristics of enamel because it has glass in it. You have to watch when you flame it because you'll burn it because it has a lower burning temperature than straight polymethyl methacrylate denture teeth. But it allows me to grind and alter the tooth as required without having to repolish it. And that's really important. We have to polish IPN again. We have to polish acrylics again because if not, it stays rough and then it'll facilitate a fast. Wear. What's nice about this is you don't have to polish it again because of the glass particles. So it gives you the look of enamel and the characteristics of enamel, especially in anterior situations or anterior teeth. The nice thing on the posterior is that it's strong, but I don't have to polish it after I adjust it. And that's a big plus for me, having I mean, to not have to do that. The teeth have opalescence in them. So opalescence, again, is like the scales of a fish. They have fluorescence. And so Vita puts fluorescence, and that's from phosphorus. And that's in our enamel, that's in our bones, and now that's in the denture teeth as well. And that's important under uh, different kinds of light and now facilitated with the example here of a black light, the teeth on the three teeth on the left have fluorescence, the three teeth on the right do not. Natural teeth have fluorescence in them. And so it gives them that life quality, vitality, life. And so again, under different lighting settings, you don't want teeth to look quote unquote dead, you want them to appear alive. And that's why Vita puts phosphorus into the product as well to make it more lifelike. So the attention is to the detail to make it look real. Again, with all my years, patients want teeth to look natural. Nobody's walked in and said, yeah, I want it to look like an denture mark. They all want it to look natural in, in different shades and bleach shade or not, but they want it to look like it belongs. And part of that is the phosphorus. And that's really important that it makes it look like it belongs in the mouth. Golden proportions. Vita teeth are golden proportion, which is also important because what it is, is it's the mathematical equation that the tooth is proportionate from length, width, height through the tooth. So it all mathematically makes sense. So our face is golden proportion. My eyes are in relation to the mathematically to the width of my nose, which is in relation to my mouth and the size of my teeth. Everything is mathematically equated. And so Vita has spent uh, resource and time to make sure that their teeth are golden proportioned as well. And that's important because what we know about golden proportion is you have to think of the pyramids and Michelangelo's David and, and artwork in general is that Artwork looks more lifelike and real when it's golden proportioned to itself. So that's important. Freedom and centric. So let's hammer in quickly now on the freedom movement. By definition, it's a flat area in the central fossa of pitch woes, um, upon which opposing cusps come into contact and degrits, <laughs> pardon me, and permits a degree of freedom in eccentric movements, uninfluenced by a tooth incline. That means you can hold the teeth in centric and wiggle them side to side and front to back in centric before they go into working and balancing. So they have an example is in your own teeth. We have freedom in our own natural teeth. And so I'd like you to touch your teeth together and try wiggling them together very gently in centric. Don't go eccentric. Don't go working and balancing. No. Just stay in centric and you can gently wiggle the teeth side to side. Everyone has approximately about a millimeter ish. That's freedom. And freedom is 
Good. Freedom is? Woo, woo. Good. Everyone has this. What's interesting and why this is important is our temporal mandibular joint is not locked together. It's not like a hinge that's locked. It can move left, right. It, can, it has freedom in it. So our natural teeth have to have freedom in it as well. Why is that? We do not touch together in a bullseye accurately every time. So the picture on the left, you need to bite in and have that little bit of freedom. So I call that horizontal green line a helicopter pad. It's a little bit of an area that I have a flexibility to touch into centric. I cannot reproduce centric accurately every time. It is impossible for my neuromuscular system to do that. It gets close, but it can't do it accurately, especially when I'm trying to choose something. The issue that we have is the hidden slide. The issue is when it touches, hits the, hits the incline of the tooth and slides into position. I'd like to share this with you. We are asking a patient to bullseye land centric every time when we say touch your teeth together. I'd like you to, to now consider that most of the denture work we do is for senior citizens and for the elderly. So now what happens is we get older our central nervous system and our neuromuscular system starts to degrade and our crispness and preciseness of being able to reproduce things becomes degraded as we get older. So with that said, we are asking now a more elderly person to be able to touch together in centric accurately every time when their neuromuscular system is starting to slowly fade with time. That's the reality of it. And I apologize, I'm gonna speak with candor and honesty here, especially those that now become compromised with their health, that have tremors, MS, Parkinson's, all these things that we start to see now clinically with patients that wear dentures, that can affect their ability to reproduce centric. Even now at the ripe tender age of 51, I can't reproduce centric every time because again, that's impossible because my system is always moving, I'm alive, my mouth and my head is always tilting, it's always moving, I'm never perfectly still, and that's why you find perfectly land-centric every time, because the muscles say don't fire at the same time accurately every, every second or every millisecond as they move. And we're asking a patient to bullseye land in centric. There are only a handful of denture teeth that have freedom and centric within them, everyone, my dear colleagues. So yes, the teeth work in balance. And that's what we're taught in school. Sure, the teeth work in balance, but when you hold them together in centric, they're locked together. There's no freedom. There's no wiggle room. And freedom is good. And what did I learn at the beginning part of my career is I banged my head on the wall, wondering what's going wrong here. I've done what the schools told me. I've done what I've been taught. I've, I, my centric is good, my bite's right, and then the patient's in with problems and the denture's moving. What did I forget was number one, the freedom and centric phenomenon. Only a handful of teeth have them globally. Vita, lingoform, MFT, physiodense, all those posterior teeth that I just spoke of, those three lines have that freedom. And now with Vigo and Vionic, so the, the digital aspect also has the freedom and center. Ivoclar has it, but only in their Phenaris products, so the high end. Uh, Mertz Dental has it with the uh, article um, and into their digital product as well. Mm. Horace Kulzer has it, premium. And I'm running short on the list, everyone. So it's, it's a very small and select group of teeth that have it. When you use 20 degree denture teeth, and I'm gonna pick on, on some suppliers here with, with much respect, but when you go and you, you use the teeth that we've been using for years, I'd like you to remind yourself, I'd like you to remind yourself, I'd like you to remember, pardon me, that those teeth come from a philosophy and from an era and a mindset from the 40s and 50s. It's, it's not 1940 and 50 anymore. It's time to to upgrade and to go with emerging trends. And part of that emergence is freedom and centric. You have to have teeth that wiggle together. 
You have to have them so that they're not locked together because it is not realistic to think of anyone on this planet that can bullseye land centric every time under every situation, yet that's what we ask them to do. So what happens is you need a, a, that degree of freedom in that center tooth within the fossa to allow for tolerance while they're living their life, eating, moving, always in motion, because then they have a degree of freedom to land so that you land in the center and you don't land and slide. The hit and slide is what rocks the denture base. That The hit and slide causes the problem. It causes that minute deflection, which causes the denture to rock. This is what it looks like here on an articulator. So now I'm going to wiggle it. You can see it wiggles. There's your freedom and centric in the middle. Now I'm doing working and balancing just like we are. And I tip the buckle cusp out of the way just to show this. That's the freedom in the middle in the centric. My articulator does it. My teeth do it. So that when you land, you're landing in a helicopter pad. It's not a bullseye. Awesome. Now, what influence is that when I say you want to land in a helicopter pad? That's a chew cycle. Pardon me, having a drink to wet my whistle. This is a chew cycle, everyone. So these are real people with natural teeth chewing carrot, apple. So I want you to watch the chew cycle. Is it straight up and down? No, it comes in at an angle. The chew cycle is shaped like a teardrop and everyone has a different shaped teardrop. See how it comes in at an angle? Look at that. You can actually even see the freedom of center when you look at the uh, upper central teeth. You can see how they come in, there's a moment of slide and then it opens. You can actually see the freedom. Look at that angle that it comes at. Where's all the teeth, or excuse me, where's all the food? Posterior. It's chewing gum. Look at that nice chew cycle. And it goes both ways, see? It went clockwise, now it goes counterclockwise, but it's in the shape of a teardrop. Now the next patient, this is really poignant. I'd like you to take a look at this next patient's chew cycle when it switches. And tell me what you see. See how it's more horizontal? Excuse me, it's more vertical. It's, it's, it's a more defined teardrop. So everyone has a different chew cycle. Some are flatter, some are oval, some are ovoid, some are teardrop. Uh, with great respect, school never taught me that. They taught me, line the teeth up in centric, Mark. Make sure there's working and balancing, Mark, and it'll fit, Mark. Guess what, Mark? It didn't work that way in real life. And so began my journey to figure out why. And so began because I, I, what I have to look forward to in my career with these complaints and these issues that I'm trying to solve, but actually are, I'm unable to solve them because I don't know what's wrong. And now here I am at year 34, realizing that everyone has a chew cycle. This chew cycle is like your fingerprint. It's like your retinal scan. It is unique to that individual. And we need to identify that if we can. How do we do that? Well, we can do that through phonetics. Phonetics, so words, will help move the jaw and give me an idea of the patient's movements. So some of the key words that we use is we have the patient count from one to 10, but what I'd like you to do and start to do is to have the patient count, the, or excuse me, have this patient speak days of the week, months of the year in English and their mother language. Days of the week and months of the year covers all the phonetics of that language. And the phonetics is, the, is what's moving and posturing the jaw to pronounce that 
sound for that syllable. I'll run the video and you'll see what I mean. Now she's not doing days of the week and months of the year. She's saying 66. And you now can start to see the movement of her lower mandible. Before we would have 66 to check anterior tooth placement against the lower, I'm checking for clearance, I'm checking against smile line, these things that, that a 66 does. I'm also checking the S sounds for the tongue. But now you can retrain your eye to look at the posturing of the mandible. Do you see the lower comes to the left? See it move? It did not come straight out. It postured forward and to the left. So now what I'm trying to demonstrate to you is that the jaw moves. And when we check an articulator and do anterior contact and protrusive contacts, we're bringing the articulator straight out to check those contacts. I am now saying to you that that's not necessarily correct for that patient. It can come out, yes, but it also can drift to the side. And we can start to identify that by retraining our eye to watch for things when people speak. So let's check this patient. She's gonna now say days of the week. Look at her jaw. See it move? And I want to share with you one more time. Take a look. Postures to the left. That. Challenge yourself. Look at the overbite and overjet I put on that case. When she touches in centric, she buries the lower anterior teeth. Challenge yourself. Challenge what you think you can do. I gave her more freedom because she postures out to the left than on the right. I buried it. Look at this. That shouldn't work in the mouth. Should it? She eats, she can eat corn on the cob. She wears no adhesive because I challenged. This is freedom. This is freedom and centric. Freedom is good. You allow for freedom. You allow for that within the per person's motion. You can achieve super hero status with a patient. You can build things that you never thought you could get away with because of freedom and using product that has freedom. Challenge yourself, become that superhero. Now, this is a patient, not a patient, this was a, a, a person that I took one of my courses. I colored her lower teeth. Now watch, she's also going to say some words for us and I highlighted this to show it. She also has a really deep overbite and overjet but watch her speak. Watch the position of her jaw. Moves a little bit. <laughs> she was having fun with that. So uh, what, am I, what I want to do is identify that with you and, and now show you freedom and centric, show you teardrops that you chew in a chew cycle. So. If you don't have access to the patient, I want you to, again, make educated decisions and try to make an educated decision about how the teeth are going to work in that patient. If we know their age or if we know the condition of their old denture, that aids us and helps us in that determination. If we see the patient directly, now what I want you to do is to, to start looking at the patient and their jaw movements. When I first started in this profession, School taught me to look at the teeth and look at how they look, where they are on the smile line, on the wet and dry line of the lip, those types of things. They wanted me to look at. 
I to now look at the function of the mandible and how it's posturing and moving. And that aids and tells me how to set their teeth within that teardrop. That's important. Why? Average adjustment rate for dentures is two to five times. What does that mean across industry globally? That patient's coming back two to five times after insert. Most adjustments are about 20 to 30 minutes in length for us to get them seated. It ties up our chair time. I am not making money when I do an adjustment, but it costs me money to run my practice. If, for example, you charge $2,600 for an upper and lower denture, say the lab fee on that is approximately 700, for example, your subtotal of profit for the office was $1,900. Office overhead runs at about 75%, give or take. That left the office a profit of $475. Based on two adjustments, you're left with a profit of $275 on an average billing rate of approximately $100 an hour. My, my billing rate. Okay, now I'm just talking the doctor's billing rate. Say we estimate it at 100 bucks an hour, conservatively. So even if we looked at overhead and you take 75% of that, it takes money out of your profit margin. The more the patient comes back, the less you, the less you earn. So, hmm, count up your adjustments, count up the cost. So as a denturist and a doctor, when you look at this, this is key because the more times that patient comes back, the less money you make. From a dental technician's perspective, you pick your top accounts and you track the, say, the last six dentures you did for that doctor and have the, have the secretary and the front end staff count up the adjustments on those cases. And now you can go to the doctor and say, we're gonna switch the teeth, the posterior teeth, especially on this, and I'm going to cut that adjustment rate in half, minimum, in half. How, much, how They're interested, believe me, in what you have to offer. Because now this is frustrating when we have many adjustments a day. I've now had the privilege of touring and lecturing globally. And I'd like to say that some offices are doing two adjustments a day, five adjustments a day, or you, you wing it into your lunch hour, and now I'm not eating lunch because there's nowhere else to put it, so I put my adjustments into lunch, or I have to stay late, or it's in break time. It's stressful. Do that through the course of your career. Even as a dental technician, it's the same stuff coming back with the same problems coming back. It wears you down. It burns you out. We can cut our adjustment rate down. And it's a big deal because now when you look at, say, one adjustment a day at 30 minutes, that's 2.5 hours a week, that's 10 hours a month, you're working for free. And that's one adjustment a day. Now imagine four. Okay, I've, I've, had, I've seen the numbers. People have, it's not just Mark that's looked at this. We've had other practitioners come and say, Mark, I'm doing 40 adjustments a month or I'm doing 100 adjustments a month based on three dentures, or even the doctors are coming and prosthodontists are telling me, Mark, I, I usually book 150 adjustments a month and I'm capped out at that because I, I don't have other time. Can you imagine being able to cut that adjustment rate down by 70 from 150 to 70? How much more free time they have to do things and to ease their stress? This is about freedom and centric. This is about stress reduction. Count up your adjustment rate. Remember, one missed dental appointment usually requires two to three more to recover that lost cost. Imagine what an adjustment does. That's lost revenue in your office because you could have given that appointment to something else to a revenue generating. How many more appointments does it take to recoup that cost? Plus you have a patient that's in your office because they have an adjustment, which means they are not happy, which means they have a sore, which means that's why they're there to see you. Freedom and centric reduces dislodgement, friction, saves you time, money, and stress, as I quickly run through these. Reduces damage and implant damage. So what does the patient want? Well, they don't want any of our 
common problems that we see. They want to be able to have this success. And when you can deliver a denture that doesn't hurt for that person, they go, huh. And then they send you work. I am living proof of this now that you can cut your adjustment rate down consistently, always. And you can deliver teeth to patients that are happy with their smile, but most importantly, have value and a quality of chewing life that can eat. So challenge yourself. You can do cross bites. You can do things that you never thought were possible before because of freedom and centric. The World Health Organization in 2019 listed burnout as now an official disease. And I've alluded to this now. We get stressed out and it wears on us through the course of our profession when we deal with the repetitive problems that we see because the bite was locked in. So applying freedom and centric not only is gonna help you and your professional happiness, but as well to your patients and to your practice. We Mark? Mark, we lost some audio.
We good? I can show my screen. I'm unmuted now. Is that better? Jim? Jim? Yeah, Mark, go ahead there we and go. start. Yeah, go ahead and start where you transitioned onto the camera. Okay. Sorry, everybody. And okay. Texts are coming in. People can hear me now. Sorry, everybody. I run fiber optic in the office, but it's got to be through, uh, through the server. And thanks to Jason Atwood for the wonderful text that you're sending me. But if you want to send me some coffee and donuts, that would work too. Okay. We're all good again? All right. Okay, so I'll circle back. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, circling back. So we're good, Jim? You can still hear me? Yes. Nice. Be good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Sorry about that technical glitch. It'll be so nice to see everybody in person again. So again, we have that freedom. So it's about a millimeter that allows it. The problem is the hit and slide. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Jason gave me the thumbs up. You can hear me. So we have the issue of the hit and slide, which is here on the guiding planes, where it hits and slides into position. So my comment is we need that cannot feel their teeth. So early in my career, when I would have a patient and I would say to them, hey, touch your teeth together. Mark, you big dummy, how, how can they feel their teeth touch? They have no nerve to the denture teeth. So a denture patient feels by the pressure exerted on the ridge. And there's a difference in the hydraulic pressure from a straight swallow and touching the teeth together when you swallow, there's a certain amount of pressure. And then when you eat or chew, there's a stronger pressure. So the patient's central nervous system learns to distinguish the pressure change that a denture puts down in different functions. So swallowing or touching the teeth is a certain pressure. Eating is a different and a stronger pressure. So when I ask a patient to touch their teeth together, the brain, their central nervous system is looking to produce the same pressure against the ridge for centric of what it's used to. Then when I build a new denture or I put in a wax rim, it's a different kind of pressure. So now I'm changing it and I'm befuddling the central nervous system slightly because I've changed the pressure. Now we take that denture and we put it on a bar on an implant and we take it off the gum totally. So now the brain doesn't have that pressure change. And now we're asking a patient to touch. Now we're relying solely on the neuromuscular system to, to, to act and to close. But a neuromuscular system, we touch together and swallow as a muscle memory. So remember, if you lie flat on your back for a month, you just don't get up and walk again because your brain loses its ability to remember how to walk because it's not firing those muscles all the time. And so now that I take a pressure off, I'm, I'm hampering the central nervous system to accurately take in information to know that it's touching. So now I put it on an implant for the first time and I ask the patient to touch. Now I'm relying solely on the muscle memory. And that's a lot to ride on everybody that you're relying on that patient's muscle memory. And now think about it in the doctor's office when they're lying down for the procedure and then they take the bite lying down or you put the patient upright and expect them to reproduce centric neuromuscularly right away. Really hard for the central nervous system to do that. This is about denture integration into the body. And this is about also thinking about a senior citizen. So now everyone has a chew cycle. So everyone has a chew cycle. So either it's more vertical or it can be more horizontal. And the trick is, is that it doesn't hit the red guiding planes and it lands into the helicopter pad without touching along the way. 
regardless of your choose cycle, that's what I want. Regardless of whether it's in true lingualized occlusion or more of a working and balancing situation, Vita teeth, so specifically lingual form, allows me that freedom to be able to come in and touch. The other important thing is you want the overhang here to help keep the food on the food table to get crushed. This is why the lingual form has such a larger lingual cusp here. This is the crusher. This is the bowl that holds the food. So this can crush the food holding on here. And so it does this in a cycle and crushes. What have I learned? My interpretation of 20 degree standard teeth that I was taught in school and raised on in the beginning part of my career is that it had to be full touch and then full working and balancing this way without the regard of a chew cycle. What happens is this is more milling, okay? Because you have to sit here and mill it like they would say flour, it mills. This is crushing. So I'm gonna move the camera up. It, Vita teeth crush the food in the chew cycle, whereas 20 degree teeth, you have to touch and mill. Well, when you touch and mill, and I try to do that mill this way, it's like, again, you aren't an articulator, you are asking someone, there has to be contact here and here through the motion. So through working and balancing contacts, you are asking someone to take their jaw and to mill food together where everything has to touch at the same time and it's a horizontal movement. You're gonna rock the denture when you do that because it sits on soft tissue. So the sheer nature of how our standard denture teeth that we use is flawed in my humble opinion. What have I learned? Crush it. I want up and I want crush this way. I don't want to mill it. I want to crush it. Mortal and pestle. This is mortar and pestle, okay? Like this, like the pharmacy or on the food channel. You're doing this. This is how you want things to work in the mouth. Get away from the motion of milling because that causes the tip, that causes the stress, that causes the chipping. So I wanted to show this quickly to again mm, use it as a demonstration tool to show our milling and the, and the fact that we have to hold them together and then have it touch is now a horizontal movement and you're asking that patient to go horizontal to be able to chew. But the fact of the matter is, is when you do horizontal, it tips it off the ridge and it's creating the problem that we're trying to fix in the first place. You have to go this way and go to crushing. It's an absolute 180, 100% change in how we approach chewing than what I was taught what I was taught 30 years ago, I've used as my base to learn from, but I've abandoned most of those principles because guess what? Didn't work for me so well. And now here I am challenging myself to do things different, that I can build denture cases with five millimeters of overbite on them and they work and they're in the mouth functioning because I've put freedom in it and I've followed the chew cycle of a patient. And that's what I wanted to demonstrate here. You challenge yourself. Yes, you can. Freedom is good. Woot, woot. All right. So here we are. Oop, I ends upside down again. Okay. So that's this example. Okay. So I had a patient come in yesterday. We started um, a new upper and lower, and it was kind of good timing. So I decided I'm going to do this conventionally uh, for this patient, and I'm just going to do it so that we can. This is a, a live case of a patient now in my office. Uh, I didn't do this one digitally. I wanted to now just do it analog or conventionally to show you. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick model analysis. Let me turn the light on. Maybe not so bright. Okay, cool. Okay, that's better. Okay, so this is a little bit, a little bit interesting because you can see the muscle mass here is different than here. 
okay? It's, it's, it's got a different tilt to it. So we're gonna circle the incisive papilla and you cut it in half. And then I'm gonna circle the long branch rugae. So these are the rugae here. So bear with me as I just try to get through and circle them here. And then I'm gonna put a dot here. So you're looking for the cuspids to follow this. So the long branch rugae always points to the cuspids. And then using a ruler, our handy dandy Vita ruler. Hey, good plug, right, Jim? So that we go from the center and I'm gonna go seven millimeters or nine millimeters ahead of the papilla. So let me put the case down so I can hold it differently. So we're gonna, so I know it's not the best. There, seven to nine millimeters, let me get rid of the glare. There, seven to nine millimeters ahead of the papilla, okay, is where our incisal edge, we're targeting the incisal edge somewhere in this area. Seven usually puts us eh, on or just behind the wet and dry line and nine will kind of go on the front of the wet and dry line. Now, why is that a big deal? Uh, the wet and dry line of the lower lip, pardon me, um, because sometimes we want more anterior support or we want more lip support for the upper, but then we typically have to bulk out the anterior flange, and now this thing becomes really bulky, but it stretches out the lip, but it also stretches out the sulcus, and then all of a sudden we're getting sores in there. So we can actually push, use the teeth to push the lip more forward on those types of cases, yet do it without making it look bucky beaverish, so that we can just change how we're positioning this incisal edge on the wet and dry line of the lower lip. So I'm cheating a little bit and I'm just trying to push it a little forward on the wet and dry line of the lower lip, using the teeth to pull and push out the lips so that this isn't as bulky or doesn't need to be necessarily as bulky. And so now when you put this on and I take a look, remember where my dots were? So the dots right here, look, that's right where the cuspid is, okay? And the dot right here, and it's showing me that I'm really close to where the cuspid is. So I have plus or minus a millimeter. So what happens is this then allows me to, to show that the cuspids are in a anatomically correct position for this patient. So that's why we know this to be true. That's why we know that the rugae shows us, again, where the cuspids are. And now that we're jumping into digital technology, that's part of a model analysis. It's because now model analysis becomes really important digitally because we have to tell the software where to put the teeth. So we're using these anatomical landmarks that, are, that they're, they're using for pinpoints based on anatomic landmarks of the person's ridge to, to be able to set the teeth in that. So that's how the software developers had to write the software. And now that's why you're seeing digital technology come with the model analysis component. And it's more a little bit more detailed than what we've been doing conventionally. So this shows us now that I'm on target for where I am. Now you can notice that I'm here but on this patient, the midline is here. So I'm skewed off the surgical midline for this person. And that's on purpose because actually this case isn't symmetrical. And so now I need to push the midline over for this, for this patient in particular. So I'm able to positioning so that the teeth are gonna function properly, as I'll say, for this, structure of this patient. So it's actually pretty cool. And that's what model analysis does. So it, it allows us to set teeth into that position. And that's what becomes really important in the position that's suited for that person. So this isn't cookie cutter. Jim said it right. This isn't just, look, you guys don't have to spend oodles of time in the lab. You still can have a production lab. Your technicians can still get cases done but they can spend a little bit of time to identify this so that they actually helps them to be faster when they set the teeth. And so I go and I set six, whoops, six anterior teeth, okay? 
And then what I do is I set the first premolar. And then from there, I can set the lower molars. So I've taken up, whoops, let's get that straight here. So now what I've done is I've stopped my model analysis quickly to show you now that I can set this. So let me backtrack slightly. So now on the lower, we're gonna circle the retromolar pads. So that identifies us where they are. Okay, so forgive me. Let's get a little bit closer. Okay, now I'm looking for the freedoms. So it's right here, and then the freedom right here. And then I'm gonna come up and I'm looking, this is where the, the first premolars or the first bicuspids go. So I'm looking for that area, okay? Look at that. Okay, so that tells me that this tooth is in the right position because the first premolars or the first bicuspids are generally right where the frenum goes. Okay, and you just follow the line up. Okay. So it's an anatomical landmark to tell me where the teeth are positioned. Now, here's my beef. And I'm about to get extremely, extremely controversial. You have a lower ridge. I take, and the school tells us that we have to put that lower tooth directly over top of the lower ridge or you fail. Now, the upper denture tooth has to follow, so it follows suit here because we have nowhere else to put it. It makes absolutely no consideration of how the upper tooth is resting on the bone structure or the rid structure. We've let the lower determine it thinking that we're helping for stability. But remember, the upper and lower have to work together, don't they? So now, if it's working for, for the bottom, but it doesn't work together, so that it's gonna mess up anyway. This is my fundamental concern. Mark, did you just say that? Yes. I sure did. Challenge yourself. So now what happens is I identify now the functional zone limit of the lower. So I don't care what this looks like. I'm not setting over the crest of the ridge at all. I don't care. Where I'm setting is now I'm setting from the identification of where the first bicuspid is and the inside line of the tuberosity. So I'm just gonna draw that back here. And as you become proficient in this, you don't even need to see the lines anymore because you know what to look for. And now I'm gonna go from here, from again, from the dot where the first bicuspid or first premolar was to the outside line of the tuberosity. And that draws a triangle for me. So what that does, is that's drawn a triangle. So imagine that triangle over top of that ridge. So, and that's the zone limit of where I can set the teeth. I don't have to follow the crest of the ridge because I don't know that that's accurate. I am following the zone limit based on anatomical landmarks. So thank you, Professor Gerber. This is based on Gerber. So this is now following the anatomical landmarks. So I can set posterior teeth anywhere within that triangle. So bear with me while I grab a second ruler. And I'm gonna take the pin out to allow me some room to move. So I'm looking for that type of triangle. And that's where I'm looking. There we go, so forgive my shakes. Okay, I'm looking that zone limit. And that's where I can set the teeth over top of that zone limit. So I'm moving my rulers to facilitate that. So I don't have to set over the ridge, I'm setting it within that triangle and that zone limit. That's setting it for the person based on anatomical structure. So again, it's a departure from what we're used to, but I'm not letting the lower 
excuse me, it's upside down. I'm not letting the lower dictate where just what's going on and where the upper is. I'm going to blend everything in. So I'm having freedom here of where I can set teeth. So when you look at my dentures, my teeth aren't necessarily over the over the crest of the ridge. They're close, but I, I can say to you that they're not bang on. And that's okay, because I've still identified it according to Gerber and that triangle. Cool, huh? We do that on the top because now we circle the tuberosities and it's the same idea. So instead of the pad, I'm using now the cuspid and I'm going to the inside part of the tuberosity with my line and now I'm going to the outside part of the tuberosity. Okay, and this now puts that triangle zone here. So that's the best triangle zone limit for this upper quadrant. And then that allows me to work and then check so that when I set the posterior teeth, I'm not necessarily on the ridge, I'm within the triangles. And then what that does is that blends it for both so that I'm not letting one dictate the other. That's the beauty of this, of model analysis. So, so on this case, so let's set some teeth. Look at this, I'm actually gonna do work today. So not only do I teach you guys every something, my dear colleagues, but I also get to work on a case and get it done for later. Win-win. So this is where now your secretary comes and says, uh, the patient's coming in 30 minutes, are you ready? Or this is where your boss comes and says, the dentist called and the case needs to be there in 30 minutes, is it ready? So, Jason, don't text me and tell me the patient's coming in 30 seconds or 30 minutes. I'm still waiting for my coffee. Okay. So how's this working now with lingualized occlusion? So I quickly just set the upper tooth into position. So what's happening now is on, on lingual form teeth, this is the cusp on the bottom and it's going to rest here into the fossa of the upper. And now on the second, there's the cusp there, and that's going to rest into the fossa here. And now on the molars, these are the target points that I'm looking for to rest. So remember we have the oversized lingual cusp for lingual form teeth. So again, we've got the oversized. Remember this is oversized. So even though I can set this in a working and balancing, so more, more of a, what we're This cusp is bigger on these teeth for that reason. Why? Because it's a crushing tooth, mortal and pestle type of design that works within the chew cycle of a patient. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking this and the secondary, so those cusps in red, Okay, and then I'm gonna position it so that it comes into contact on the bottom, okay? Now, what you notice on these teeth, so just like this, okay? Now, I have the ability to take this. Now, let me just go a little, a little closer, okay? I have the ability to take that tooth and I can push the neck in. So. I can go more lingualized where I, I, you see that gap created, okay? So that gap is what I've just done, is I've taken and I've done this, I've tipped it up. Now, why would I wanna do that? 
Well, if I want a straight, more lingualized tooth, if I have the linea albicans here, um, that, that little mark on the cheek where I want to push the cheek out, say they have a real horizontal chew cycle, and I want to keep this out to watch the hit and slide, I can do that. Or I can, as I said, close it up and tip it in. So coming back to this, what you're going to notice is, again, or I can close it in, like we're, like we're a little bit more used to. See how I can close it in? And I look more like that. So this still operate in a lingualized occlusion, mortal and pestle principle, but it's not as gappy. With that said, you still are going to notice spaces here. So you still have some slight gapping. It's a little bit different than what we're used to with a standard 20 degree setup where everything was more knuckle tight. It cannot be knuckle tight. That doesn't work anymore. That's what causes a lot of our grief, everyone. You have to open it up because the food's got to get in here and it's got to stay to get crushed by the crusher in the bowl that's bringing the food up. It's got to do that. That's how this works. Natural occlusion is based on a mortal and pestle crushing. Lingual form teeth are the same principle. They're a crushing tooth, physiodense, crushing, even MFT, crushing. This is not milling. Yet most of the occlusion that we've been doing and that we taught ourselves has been milling. And now up the trends. And what's trending? We're going now crushing. This is going to reduce your adjustment, reduce the problems. This has been my journey. This has been what I'd like to share with you now in supporting a profession that I love and helping us grow. This is about challenging and understanding now that I'm going to a crushing tooth, which is more precise, it's more functional, and it's more efficient. That's the word I was looking for. And that becomes now more efficient. So I have the ability now, as I slowly turn and you can see, we have overlap. So this what helps keep the food on the food table to get crushed. We have slight gapping so that, again, the food can stay on. Because when you have knuckle tight occlusion, it squeezes all the food off. It's less efficient. Remember the chewing video. You need some of the food to stay on here to continue to get crushed. The teeth have a bow to them. So you can see we've got a nice bow, which has helped pushing the cheek out. And now, let's go to my next controversial comment. We are taught to open the articulator, doesn't matter what kind you use, and we're taught to do this. I want you to think back to that chew video that I showed you earlier. Did anybody do this or any type of form of this action? Did they really? We don't, you don't chew like this, yet this is how we check things. I want you to now open our, your articulator. And I've done this now on, uh, from hinge articulators all the way up to the real complicated articulators. I want you to do a chew cycle. This is how a person's gonna use this product. They're gonna do this. And they're gonna chew left and right. That's what I want to check now to see how the teeth are operating each, in each, with each other. I am looking for hit and slide. I'm looking for positioning. So how do I check that? So we used to check with articulating paper. So forgive me, I'm gonna just wipe this clean here. So the pens
that'll work. All right. So I'm using Statler non-permanent, or you can also use um, a Sharpie non-permanent. These are made in Germany. Sehr gut. Okay, so you can use a Statler Luma color. So this is what I do in the lab. I do not use articulating paper anymore. Articulating paper bends between the teeth and gives you a wrong reading. I'm going to circle the cusps. So these are the crushing cusps. And now I can go in and I can check centric, centric, sure. But now I'm going to go through a chew cycle. And you'll get to learn and you'll challenge yourself and you'll get to learn how to move an articulator and you start doing a chew cycle. And now do they have more of a horizontal or is it more vertical? And now we'll go light free and I'm gonna get, there we go. Focus. Okay. See that mark right there? That hit the guiding plane. See that? So when I started to go and I used the chew cycle, it hit the guiding plane right there and it's going to slide into position. So now I can go and take a burr and grind this guiding plane away. And now that if you do this, so again, forgive me. When you do that type of motion, and I do this, you you're feeling the teeth work together in a chew cycle. You'll actually be able to feel if it hits and slides, and you'll actually learn what tooth is hitting. You don't even need to see it. You'll feel it. And now we see again, we've got the hit and slide right there. So I can go and adjust this. So I use a very fine diamond or something very, very fine. Okay, even a rubber wheel would work, something fine. And I don't have to polish it again. Why? Because this is acrylic glass. And then that's how I check this. So why don't I use articulating paper? I'll show you. So forgive me, I got to hold everything and try and make it work. And and now you're going to see the articulating paper bends and puts all these more marks on the teeth. How do I know what is accurate or not? Because the ba the paper is bending between the teeth. So that's why I use I don't use articulating paper. Now, how do I check this in the mouth? Well, you check it in the mouth. If I take horseshoe articulating paper and I put this in my mouth, what's the first thing that's going to happen is my tongue's going to hit this and my tongue is going to go backwards and get out of the way and it's going to recoil. My bite's wrong because now I've retreated my tongue. I've, I've retreated my mandible. Centric is off, so your bite's off. Don't use horseshoe articulating paper in the mouth ever because it retreats the tongue. So then you say, well, Mark, what we'll do is we'll just, we'll fold it and I'll use those calipers and I'll put it in. Sure, sure. So now you've stuck calipers in and you've pushed the cheek out on a patient and said, bite, 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 tap, tap, tap. And now you've introduced a stimulus and pushing the cheek out. Do you think this muscle is going to work in the same manner and give you an unbiased reading when it's got something pushing against it? No, it won't. The bite's buggered. Don't ever do that. Well, Mark, how do I check it? Okay. Whoops. Rotate. So in the mouth, if I have to check this, Q-tip, I put um, Vaseline. So I Vaseline 
a cotton swab or a Q-tip and I, oh, let me just clean, sorry, I forgot to clean. And I take the Q-tip And now I put the color on the Q-tip and then I can go and I dry the denture off. And then I can color the teeth. See, why not? So I'm doing this quickly. So my apologies. But you can come in here and you can really color the teeth. So it'll work quite well. And you color it. And then that goes into the patient's mouth. And then I can get them to function. English, second language, if they have one. Why second language? Because when they leave your office, they're not speaking English. They're going to speak their second mother tongue. So that's the, their primary language. And now look what it did. Here, I'll bring it up and you can see that the color bled down and it marks it for me. And now I can find that in the mouth without introducing an outside stimulus into the mouth by altering the position of the tongue or the cheek by using the retractors or the calipers or whatnot. I'm letting the patient give me unaltered, unfiltered feedback about their system and then that's how what i can use now to check and that's how you can check it in the mouth whether it's an implant case or a denture case or or such and that's how you can check for the marks without adding that outside external stimulus so what we're looking for now is a a little bit more gapping. I can take the teeth and I can have them more down so it's a, a little bit of a closer contact. Or if I need to, I can tip the teeth up and go more lingualized depending on my needs and the needs of the patient. So the model analysis allows me reference points to know that I'm setting the teeth within the proper skeletal system and anatomical landmarks of that person. I've identified a triangle zone limit, upper and lower, that I function in according to Gerber, that allows me not to sit over the crest of the ridge, but allows me to move that tooth over a little bit within that triangle, which allows me, again, a little bit more freedom. I'm using a denture tooth that has freedom in it, so that the whole goal behind this is stability of the denture in the patient's mouth when it goes under function. It does not function like this in the mouth. It functions like this in the mouth. Challenge yourself. So this goes now and functions. So now I have a helicopter pad to land on. I'm checking the guiding planes of the teeth to look for hit and slide because the hit and slide causes the damage. So this is the same thing now digitally. I start out with the digital. The, the software is going to set the teeth into position, but I know coming out of, out of production, when I touch them into centric, I'm going to have that little bit of wiggle room. And if I have to, I can manually adjust the teeth because even Vigo is still made from acrylic glass. I still have that. Or in the software, if I know that I have a little bit more of a horizontal chew cycle, I can manually go in and manipulate these, these cusps and tip them a little bit manually as well. So I can do that digitally, pardon me. I can tip them digitally from where the software set them up. Remember, the software is basing the setup on model analysis. So when you go through model analysis, it's actually critical that you put those dots accurately, wherever you mark those dots and, and their reference dots, depending on the software that you use, 
you have to make sure that you're accurate where you put it. Don't rush that job. Don't rush that step because the software is basing setting the teeth on that, what I've just showed you. And that's accurate and it needs to be accurate. So please don't rush that step. It's really important digitally because that's what the software is using to set the teeth in for you. Okay, so it's using what I showed you here conventionally and, and how to manipulate it conventionally. That's what the software is doing digitally. So let's set some lower anterior teeth and then I'm going to get into my third and final controversial position. So bear with me. Get the camera. All right. Okay. Where do you set lower anterior teeth in reference to the upper anterior teeth? How? How much? What do you do? Well, Mark, you set them one to one or you set them two to two. Why? Because the textbook told me to? Because my boss told me to? Because my instructor told me to? Yeah, but why is one to one and why is two to two? What's better? What's right? How do you know? How do you know that's right for the patient? How do I know I'm one to one or two to two? How do you check that? I mean, I got to flip it again. Just a minute. There we go. So again, what we're there we go. What we're going to do? Let me reposition. Thank you for your patience. Is laboratory speaking, I'm going to check and I'm going to draw there. So I'm going to color that. Into orally, I'm going to take the Q-tip color the paper and then mark it for in the clinic so into oral chair side and then i can reinsert the denture into the patient's mouth and then i'm going to get them to talk days of the week months of the year remember they just don't go forward so we check protrusion forward that doesn't mean that it's going to happen like that in the mouth. So I can do different unless I know that they posture to the left, for example. And then I can check because then it'll mark up here and then I can adjust it and finite adjust that in the mouth. So you have to keep this in mind. If you know from a technician's perspective, you get the case in and you know that you're replacing a 30 year old denture and it's worn flat they're gonna have a very flat chew cycle. So what's gonna happen is that's gonna be emulated here. They're gonna have a very horizontal chew cycle. So you can start to adjust this already to watch for clearance. Now here's, here's my controversial comment. I don't set one to one, I don't set two to two. I set all over the place because I'm watching the person and then I check. You have to appreciate that person has a specific condylar angle for them. A condylar angle is usually set at 30 degrees, but how do I know it's 30? But that 30 affects tooth position and how this postures. So unless you take measuring tools to measure a condylar angle, so we can do that conventionally, which is hard to do. We you can do that with graphs and pentagraphs and, and functional wax rims and such. You can get a digma, which which is a the digital jaw analyzer from Cavo from Cavo, uh, and you can use a Digma. Um, I know that there's some other products coming to market as well um, that have that ability to start to now measuring condylar angle. If you have a articulator that can adjust condylar angle, that's great. 
other articulators, it's non-adjustable. Uh, hinge articulators or things like that that we we see in in many labs. This is it is the, the it is what it is. The number is the number. Yet I'm I'm trying to check protrusive, so I really don't know is that condylar angle and that movement the same than what it's going to be in that patient's mouth. So the answer is no, it's not going to be. Yet I'm setting it and I'm checking it here yet it goes into the mouth of the patient and it's wrong. So I don't pay a lot of attention now to protrusive and getting all the thing touches together on an articulator. Uh, yeah, I just said that. And now it's for record of all time that I, I because what happens on an articulator is not what happens in the mouth, everyone. And so I'm trying to set and get this beautiful protrusive and, and contact and end-to-end -end contact and cusp contact here on something that I don't even know is, is, is what that's like in the patient's mouth. So I spend all that time to get it perfect here when all of these arcs and angles can be off in the person. So I check that in the person. So if you can't check it in the person because you're a dental technician and I can't check it, then you hedge your bets as much as you can to allow freedom and, and touching, but, and, and allow so that it doesn't hit so that you don't have the tooth chippage and the teeth chipping. And if it comes back chipped, then we got it wrong. This isn't the manufacturer's fault if an anterior tooth chips. Jim, you're recording this. It is not the manufacturer's fault when an anterior tooth chips. It's on me. I set it in the wrong position for that person. And now it's telling me a story, especially if it breaks repetitively. It's telling me a story. It's in the wrong spot. Next controversial. We expect that the teeth come together to touch so the patient can touch in, bite, and tear the sandwich again and away. The teeth have to touch. They can't feel their teeth touch together. There's no nerve to them. How do they know they're touching an anterior contact? How do they know they've postured their jaw far enough ahead to make the teeth touch? They can't feel them. So, so it's not very accurate, is it? Because they can't tell. So now why do I need one to one and two to two? I debunk that entire because now it's up to the patient and how they posture forward. And when they come in, they're coming in to touch and it's typically not end to end, it's coming in on the lingual and that's what's holding the food and touches the food and bites the food off. Is they're not coming end to end as they are coming forward and it's coming on the lingual. That's what happens in natural dentition. Now, I appreciate that artificial dentition can't always mimic natural dentition to each degree. We need a little bit of freedom there. Why? Because there's no nerve. This is denture integration into the body. No nerve. The patient cannot tell accurately. So we have to allow them a little bit of that freedom. They can't go end to end because they can't tell it's end to end. They need to come in and they're going to touch on the lingual. But remember, there's food in the way and that's what's bracing it. And then they tear it away with their fingers. That's my other of what I've realized in my humble career. I am not shooting for end-to-end -end contact anymore, okay? But that's a whole other course that we can take. If you'd like to see an anterior tooth setup course, please write that in the comments section or let us know, and we can I can draft an anterior tooth setup course. And then once we can travel again, we can do it in person. We can do courses in person. I will come to your lab in person. We can do things. So this is where I check here. I don't have the pin in. I'm just checking on the articulator at base settings. And then I'm gonna check that in the mouth afterwards using the cotton swab and the articulating paper and inking it out for me. Cause then I can, you can see there's that mark right there. So that's how we set anterior teeth, okay? So with that said, wrapping up, what have we determined today? We've determined, and I've showed you, freedom, 
I'm still upside down. Well, you know, it's Canada. Okay, so we've done freedom, freedom and centric, wiggle room. Freedom is good. You got to have some wiggle. This is the wagon seal wiggle. You got wiggle. Now it's a chew cycle. It's got to operate in that chew cycle without hit and slide into position, conventional or digital. It's got to go in. So you got to watch the guiding planes, open the guiding planes up as required. Everyone has a chew cycle. How to identify that chew cycle? Days of the week, months of the year. Or you can actually have them chew and watch it. So I've had patients come in and I bring in uh, cucumber or green pepper. I find that or red pepper. I find that working well. And I'm looking to watch the chew cycle of that person. Challenge yourself. I've set now teeth and I've showed you with buried five millimeters of over jet, overbite, <coughs> pardon me. And the case works. Why? Freedom. Challenge yourself. Now we've done model analysis where I've gone through and I've pinpointed anatomical landmarks for that person based on the impression. And now I can identify where the teeth are going better for that person. More customized, less cookie cutter. Doesn't take me a lot of time to do that. Let's me be more accurate. Shut the light off because it's blinding me. There we go. Then I set teeth, not knuckle tight. Can't be, it's not milling. It's crushing, we crush you, yeah. It's crushing. It's mortal and pestle. Whether it's lingualized or even more of a standard working and balancing type of approach. And then I work within that chew cycle. I've now showed you how to check for that. I use the pen. I use a swab for clinical side, chair side. Get your hands off the person. Don't manipulate the data that they're trying to give you. Don't stick articulating paper in their mouth. It changes the position of their bite. Don't use the forceps to go in there. It changes the position of their bite. Don't get them to think. Stop using the words close or bite. Use the word swallow. That is a subconscious command. When you get a patient to think about the bite, how do they know they're biting in the right spot when they can't feel it? You want the subconscious to come in because a swallow action will touch the teeth into centric and load them in the centric without the conscious mind manipulating the data. There's your other tip. Now the system functions for the patient. I check anterior, again, I'm, I'm getting better as I get a little older, to watch jaw movement, and then I make a couple little notes for the case of how much overbite and overjet I'm setting. It's never one to one or two to two. It's 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 all over the map for me based on what I think that patient is and needs from me. This is about me trying to be a superhero for them. I'm following some rules, but I'm also manipulating things, and I'm using a product that can manipulate and let me work. There it's straight and let me work as well and and be flexible because I need it to be flexible. A conductor doesn't teach each member of the orchestra how to play. They know how to do their job. He's there to help them feel the passion of the music and move through it. This is about your experience and passion for dentures coming through using products that manipulate and work with you to achieve that passion and goal and being able to provide a denture that works and is customized for that patient without having to spend a great deal of time on it. I've spent some time to show you, challenge yourself, but it takes time to break those old patterns of what you used to do or what you're currently doing. You can challenge yourself and become more. My journey has been that of challenge and letting go of what I thought was hard and fast rules. And now I'm able to become more of a superhero consistently for people, drop my adjustment rates, have less stress, less repeated problems, less common issues that we experience consistently. 
So that's how we're going to build our profession and move our profession forward. That's how you build your business, whether you're a technician, insure us and move it forward. This is about controlling your adjustment rates and becoming more efficient and delivering a product that fits more to that patient. Okay, Jim, you can jump online. Do we have any questions? Geez, I, I didn't say very many controversial things at all today, so we should have no questions. <laughs> Not at all, yeah, no. We have uh, quite a few questions. Uh, so I'm come, going to, before we get to come, the questions. Hey, come see me uh, in I'm, person. One day when we can get together again, everybody, I'm telling you, let's have some fun. Definitely. Okay. All right, so before we get to the questions, mm -hmm. Uh, just a reminder that uh, this has been recorded. So those of you who want to revisit it, uh, please um, see us online, whether it's through the Vita North America website, the YouTube channel, um, and, and so forth. We have a lot of recordings, uh, as I mentioned earlier with Mark. We probably got banked to probably about uh, 10, 11, 11 different webinars, different uh, programs on different subject matter. Uh, we will, it's a good suggestion. We can probably set it again sometime this year, a anterior only setup. That's a sound, sounds like a good, uh, good concept, good subject matter. Only if you want we get a lot of calls on that, Mark, so that would work well. Uh, so if you're interested in CE, you should get an email from our marketing education staff that will ask you a few questions that you can submit. Uh, we'll need your CVT number and so forth. Uh, again, all these webinars, everything is going to be posted. Uh, please take an opportunity to, to uh, see those webinars. If you need to get a hold of us at the technical support hotline at Vita North America, here is some information. Here is, uh, Mark showed it earlier, but uh, a list of our uh, beat uh, North American uh, sales reps that maybe you want to get in touch with as well. As well. Uh, we do have additional programs, uh, September 16th, October 5th, November 23rd, December 6th with Mark and others. So we've got quite a few uh, different various uh, subject matters. Uh, to discuss, Mark's going to go over, I think we have another, uh, like a class two, class three, combination syndrome, uh, all of those biggies that people are interested in as well. Uh, so join us. Uh, you can get a hold of Mark. Mark's gracious enough to let us provide his information. So if you need to talk to Mark, this is his contact information. Please feel free to uh, give him a call and ask them, you know, further questions. Facebook, right, Instagram, Mark? too, sorry for interrupting. Okay, so look me up there, too. I'm here to support you. We are here to support you and your success and growth. So as far as uh, questions and answers, let's get to that. We've got quite a few. Um, so the first one is, I have a problem identifying the, the long branch rugae. How common is it to be very identifiable? What would be the ways to I, help identify that long right. branch? Rugae? So the long branch rugae is typically right behind the incisive papilla. So it's the first rugae right behind the incisive papilla. And you're looking for it to end just as the arch kind of starts to turn where the canines would be. So that's typically from a visual perspective of where you're looking for it. The other reason that you can have a hard time identifying it is when if the patient takes their dentures out and an impression is taken immediately, the tissue is still somewhat compressed. So if you're a denturist, have them leave the teeth out longer before you take the impression. It's going to be hard in a dentist's office to ask for that, but if you can have the patient leave the denture out or come into the office without the denture in, or leave it out in the car right over, quickly put it in, run into your office, get them seated, take it out again immediately, you're going to take the impression over less compressed tissue and those rugae will pop even more. All right. 
Uh, there's a question about what do you do about the compensation curve uh, according to Hanau's theory? You the work with that? The yeah, the fee, fee and Wilson. Fee and Wilson. Yeah, I never touched on that today. Um, geez, that would have been a fourth controversial topic. <laughs> um, yeah, so tip, so so specifically to today, lingualized. Lingual form teeth can be set on a flat or a curved plane. They work. The teeth actually have a compensating curve built inside the tooth. So it allows you a great degree of flexibility. Um, that's a really uh, long winded, this will be a long winded response. So typically you can set to a 20 degree curve if you're comfortable with that theory. What I do is I will look, I set freehand, so I don't set to a plate anymore. I used to set to a flat plate and then a curved plate, and I, 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 I don't use anything, I go visual. But after 34 years, I would hope I'd start to, my eye would train myself. Typically, what I do is I'm checking the shape of the ridge. So Mark, I'm going to go ahead and um, if you want, Mark, I'm going to give you the uh, control so that you can, if you want to see, show that underneath the camera, okay? Okay. I will assume control. All right, it's all yours. You're you're on. Okay. Let me jump to the camera, everyone. Okay, so, so typically when we're doing a compensating curve, I try to set to the ridge and that patient's ridge. So this is kind of a good one to show because we've got a pretty good dip here. So I actually, in general, I'm trying to set teeth to this. So the thought process behind that is you have a ridge, there's the retromolar pad, I'm trying to emulate this so that the teeth are always contacting the ridge against a 90 degree angle to help push the denture down during function. If, for example, I used a 20 degree template, for example, I can't guarantee that that 20 degree is this hitting that ridge in the same manner. You can't. So I do a customized curve myself. So I eyeball that based on the shape of the ridge. Now what you can do to facilitate that for yourself on a learning perspective when you're starting out is you can get, so that was a gift for me or to me. And you can get yourself a, it's like a it's like a protractor compassy and i can go and i can take and i can draw Isn't that neat and i can draw the shape of the ridge on the side of the model and then use that as a reference of setting the teeth on when i set the teeth okay but from a technical perspective vita in their international setup guides will show this with a string, so they'll they'll use a, a an elasticized string on their international setup guides, just because again this is international, so it has to go to different markets. You can set the teeth on a 20 degree setup template, a flat setup template. You can set the upper teeth first, and then the lower. Whatever your setup technique is now, these teeth will work in the same process. Specifically, that's what I do from a from a curve of speed type of idea is I'm following a customized approach to the patient and the snapshot of time for that patient. That's what I do. Hey, Jim, next question. All right, so 
you had talked about uh, a case where you came to the conclusion by the two cycle to open up and have a overjet overbite uh, of five millimeters. The question yes. is, how did you how did you determine the five millimeters? How did because yeah so from the patient's setup. So when I had the models articulated and I had everything articulated, Jim, have you seized control again? No, you still have it. Okay. So if you want to show okay. anything. No, that's fine. You can seize control because I can't see much right now on my end. There, yeah, that's great. Thanks. So from that case where I had that, that set up, when I set the anterior teeth and, and I had to get the lower in and at that vertical, I realized, huh, I, I have some problems here. I need to follow that type of setup. That came from, from the ability of once I had the, the bite taken and saw the, the model analysis and saw what I needed to do from a standpoint of where the teeth needed to set, those lower anterior teeth were going to be quite buried in occlusion. And so that's where I came from. It was sort of um, um, a whole piece of the pie leading me down that path of I needed to give that aggressive amount of, of over jet and over bite on that person, especially the over bite on that specific case. And that was about when I, I comment about challenging yourself. That case too specifically was, a, was, was an, an immediate denture. And so she had that also from her natural setup. So I, we're typically want to change that when we do dentures. And now I, I don't. Lady Gaga said it right, baby, you were born this way. And, and I really taken that to, to heart from a, from a denture perspective is if that's how it is for them and that's how they were born and that's how they grew up and that's what they've experienced and that's how their central nervous system functions, then far be it for me to change that in their denture. So part of that as well was, was me following how it was for them naturally. So you can still gain that when you have your models and your bite taken and where you need to set the anterior teeth and then how am I gonna set the lower? Don't be scared now, challenge yourself. And if you need to do that and you need to overbite it a ton, that's okay because now you have freedom and freedom is good. All right. But so to you directly. We have a, um, a question actually from Nambia, Southwest Africa. Uh, Gunther, he's asking, uh, how do we do a dynamic bite registration always struggling to get the patient to bite correctly. Do not use the word bite. Use the word swallow. First off, the command words you use. So swallowing will always take them back to their physiological center. So you're, ask, you're accessing the subconscious command of swallowing. When we swallow, it's not conscious. It's an unconscious act to swallow. So you're asking the person to swallow. So they'll kind, they'll come in and, and uh, go in and they'll touch together in their physiologic centric. The second thing is, is if you're using wax rims, don't make them bulky and, and thick. I shape wax rims in the shape of a denture with an incisal edge of a millimeter because that's how it is in the denture. I form that wax rim just like a denture. And then I keep the top cold, and then I warm the bottom occlusal surface, just the occlusal surface of the wax, and then I insert that in the mouth, and I have them to just swallow. And then you can key it with a knife, with knife marks, or you can make little key marks and inject some quick set material to lock it in. But you want to use the word swallow, don't open. Swallow, don't open. Don't ever use the word bite. Stop using the word bite. Stop using the word close. Those are conscious commands. Use unconscious. Think like a denture patient. They can't feel it. They're looking for, again, the compression of what they're used to. And now shoving a wax rim in their mouth isn't the same. So I carve my wax rims 
as close to their old denture as possible to make so I don't befuddle and 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 alter their central nervous system as much as possible. Great question. All right. So with the setup uh, that you talked about before, um, what about the vertical dimension, especially in the anterior? How did you determine that? The case before, so we're talking about the, yeah, that's a good one now. Hey, talk about controversial. Okay. So vertical dimension. Uh, so that case was an immediate and she was overclosed and, and, and it was, uh, she had a collapsed bite. And again, this was um, a middle-aged woman that was also had some issues uh, going on for her personally. And then she also has um, it's like this long. And now I look at her and I'm, I'm, I size her up because does she handle change well? No. Is she more sensitive? Yes. So I'm going to leave her collapsed. So the vertical dimension on that case is collapsed and everything that the textbook tells me that I shouldn't do, I did. And it works and she can eat without adhesive. So my point, challenge yourself. So how did I check the vertical on that case? Because I made a, a conscious decision that she was not presenting with temporomandibular joint dysfunction she didn't have an, any trigger points or any existing conditions that, that, that I thought that I needed to change her vertical and open her up a lot. I purposely left her over close because that's how she's been for years and years and years and years and years. And my interpretation of the person was, I am not going to change you because I don't think she can handle the change. If, if a patient can handle the change, how often or how much vertical do you open up a patient? What's what's tolerated? Yeah. So that's 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 professional judgment. So that's a hard question to answer because it depends now specifically on that person. And sometimes you can splint therapy them first. You can try out and maybe say to them, look, we're going to do a treatment plan can can maybe include a test denture where we open the vertical, say three to four millimeters, and then we have to build you another one in a year where we open another three to four. So treatment plan now can take a year, two years, so long as they're on board. But it depends on the, the situation of when they present themselves into your office. How much trouble are they in when they sit down in your chair? And then you have to make a determination of what do I think and present them with options. And then again, are they prepared to follow you for a year or two on a treatment plan and several ventures to correct things? Um, that's a lot to ask of someone uh, and, and to follow through with it. So to answer that question, it's, it's very specific to each individual case. This is about denture integration into the body. This is about me feeling out the patient to see where they're at, how their feelings are, what they're looking for, how much is their chewing life being hampered currently and what's the quality of their chewing life so if they are overclosed but they say i have no problems no pain and i can eat and really i'm only here because if i open the vertical dimension a lot because the textbook tells me and i build them a great technical denture if you didn't want it you're not going to like it are you so again if I want steak, but my wife forces me to get chicken, hey, it was a chicken. Eh, I really wanted a steak tonight. Yeah, but Mark, you ate steak yesterday. You should have chicken to enjoy it as much. Why? Because I didn't want it. So a part of denture integration in the body is, is assessing the patient, where they're at, their quality of chewing life, the technical things that present themselves in the mouth for you, and then you have to take all of those things in that piece of the pie and decide, what am I going to do? That's a whole other course. But what I can tell you is part of the psyche of the person is I look at their hand and I'm looking to see their skin and their skin type and their hand and what I see. You're, Mark, are you nuts? No, that's a whole other course. So I, I touch on that on some hands-on when I have two days with you, not an hour and a half, 
where I can show you what I'm looking for because this tells a story. If they have thinning skin here, you bet it's thinning here in the mouth. If I can see through it and it's bruised, then I know it's going to bruise here quicker. Why would I open the vertical? So this is about denture integration. Jim, here's another concept for another course that we could do. Now, assessing the patient. The only good ideas we're coming up with today. So we that's in a nutshell my response to that question. All right. Um, on the post here, how do you determine the width, the occlusal width of your posterior teeth? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, again, Vita, their mold guides, they, they set the posterior in relation in golden proportion to the anterior. So they will give you the size match. Sometimes I don't follow that proportionate rule, even though I trust Vita that they golden proportioned it. I'm, I'm looking at the amount of space and the width of the ridge and the width of the space on each division, each divisional arch. So each individual arch and how much tooth size do I need for that specific person? So you can tell in a nutshell verbally, if it's more narrow, you want to go a little more on the narrow side. If we have a, a vast expanse of space in there, from a ridge perspective, then I can use a slightly larger tooth to fill the voids up and to fill the space up. In a nutshell, that's how I would re respond to that question. Typically the manufacturer, and just because it's Vita, I know it's golden proportion together and they started from the golden proportion theory. So I trust that. But if I'm gonna override that, then I'm gonna override on that specific criteria in terms of, of what I feel space-wise I can get away with. All right, so we're going to wrap it up with one last question, and that is, uh, is it necessary to take a new bite registration in, for each denture try-in to be sure for the next steps? Great, Only one necessary, question. right? Um, so, so, so my question is, are you a denturist or a doctor? Can you quickly type in that response and Jim can see it? Because that's a professional judgment call. Because again, what parameters have changed from the new denture to the try -in? Excuse me, what parameters have changed from the existing denture to today's try -in that you're trying in? If there's a vast change of vertical, if there's a vast change in, say, thickness, if there's a vast change in size because the old one was underextended and now the new one's more extended. You are changing the perception of the central nervous system when you try in that denture. So the chances of the central nervous system giving an incorrect reading that the bite is correct, then I would say yes, I would be more in tuned to take a check bite on that case. The more you change, the harder it is for the central nervous system to adapt to those changes and accurately give you information that it's processing those changes, especially on an elderly person when they also have issues. So again, it's a, it's a holistic approach of look at your patient, assess your patient, their age, their dynamics, their, are they on a walker, a cane, their, their skin, how frail are they, their attitude, are they mad at the world? Or are they a nice person with a nice disposition? Okay, I, I can remember just off topic, I, I built a denture for a patient and during the course of treatment, she mentioned to me the company that she hired to mow her lawn, ruined her lawn. The company she hired to shovel her sidewalk in the winter used the wrong type of shovel and ruined the concrete. The cab driver that didn't help her to the door with her groceries. The other cab driver who helped her to the door with the groceries slammed her screen door and ruined it in her perception. So do you think she liked the teeth I built for her? And then I'm left wondering, well, geez, what happened? Well, she's mad at the world. So coming back and tying it together, a check bite, yes. The more you change, 
the more you, the central nervous system has a hard time adapting to those changes and can give you a false reading. Yes. And you want to check it by not using the words bite. You want to use the words swallow. Because then if she swallows or the patient swallows and you see that bite drift back, then you know you need to take a check bite. Swallowing will always, again, remember it's a subconscious effort. Subconscious command. You're tapping into the subconscious of the central nervous system. I have immense respect for the central nervous system. And my goals every day are learning more and more and more about the central nervous system and denture integration. So I think, uh, Mark, I think we've, we've lost uh, your connection, audio and video. So I think I'm going to sum this up. Uh, I want to thank you very much for your, um, again, your great presentation and providing all of us with some very useful information, practical information that we can use in our laboratory, in our uh, office. Oh. Um, as a denturist, technician, and or, um, te you know, or dentist. So I want to thank you very much for uh, everyone for participating and joining us. This has been recorded. You can join us online. Uh, Mark, I got you back. So if you want to just uh, any final thoughts or wave yeah. goodbye. We're... Thanks for making time. Thanks for making time for yourself. Thanks for trying to be a superhero. We are all here to support you in that endeavor, and it's okay. Challenge yourself. Step outside and, and, and challenge yourself of what you think can be done. That's how I'm here today, and then I'm able to take that and become more of a superhero in the treatment room for those patients because I stopped and said, wait a minute, I can do better, and I pushed myself. So thank you for attending this to push yourself forward. We're here. To support you. All right. Well, thank thank you, Mark. We lost you again, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Great presentation. I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and this concludes uh, this Vita Learning webinar with Mr. Mark Wagenseal. Thank you very much. Lost it again. Oh, we're good. Okay.